In the first decade of the 20th century, there was a major transportation revolution taking place. With the advent of modern industrialization and the invention of internal combustion engines, it was the birth time for many iconic American companies. Close behind the tail of Indian motorcycles, Harley-Davidson got its start in 1903, when Bill Harley and Arthur Davidson were rapidly innovating their first motorcycles. In the early 1900s, competition was fierce, innovation was quick, and the young motorcycle industry was very cut throat. Indian Motorcycles at this time was the clear leader. Other brands like Excelsior and Harley Davidson, the clear underdogs, were doing everything they could to prove themselves on the flat track and in endurance races. Well before the magazines, the professional reviewers, and the online influencers, racing quickly became the benchmark for a brand to prove itself worthy of a consumer's dollar. However, the road to success in the motorcycle industry in the early years was not easy. In 1908, Henry Ford released the first Model T. Motorcycle companies not only had to compete against one another, they also had to compete with the mass production of the automobile and the aggressive price point that was brought about by their economies of scale and their production with their assembly lines. In the 1930s, the Great Depression hit and things only got harder from there. Many of the smaller motorcycle companies that started up in the early 1900s had to close their doors. Harley-Davidson was able to hang on financially partially due to their partnerships with the military and law enforcement. They were able to land some contracts during World War II that would help them weather the financial storm. In 1953, the once known as the giant in the motorcycle industry, Indian Motorcycles Manufacturing Company ceased operations and discontinued production on all models. As the largest remaining American motorcycle manufacturer in the world, it was Harley-Davidson's job to push the sport and the industry further into the next generation. With Americans now enjoying the ability to travel further and faster in their cars and motorcycles, America put a lot of emphasis and resources in expanding and making the road system more robust traveling from the east to the west coast. Roads like America's Highway, the Route 66, were developed to transport goods and services and people to all over the large United States landmass. But it wasn't all about just the utility and the practicality of transporting goods and services around. Americans were developing a love and a passion for touring the United States. Traveling these large vast roads around the country became somewhat of a hobby and a favorite pastime for Americans. At this point, it was up to Harley-Davidson to create an entirely new genre of motorcycles. Harley-Davidson would proceed to pioneer the touring class of motorcycles. Bikes that were built for long-haul comfort, that were designed to go on long-haul trips, overnighters, and give the maximum amount of comfort. They would develop fairings for wind deflection, saddlebags for storage. This touring class of motorcycles would define Harley-Davidson, and over time become their bread and butter, and eventually would make them the benchmark in which all other touring motorcycles were judged upon. American touring is a state of mind. It is the ultimate sort of aspirational act in motorcycling. It's this wanderlust in terms of trying to get over the next horizon. Grand American Touring is created by Harley Davidson. It's something that we invented just by the organic evolution of the motorcycles that we were producing over the years. By 1969, we have a batwing fairing, we have hard saddlebags. The bike started to evolve into bikes that were much more capable of traveling long distances now known as the Grand American Touring Motorcycle. Hey, what's up guys? Matt here coming to you from Laidlaw's Harley-Davidson. So this is a review that I've been looking forward to doing for a very long time now. We are going to be looking at the 2023 model year, a CVO Road Glide and Street Glide. So they have been out now for about a month, but I wanted to take my time on this video just because of how important these models are in Harley-Davidson's history as a whole. So I've waited till I rode both of the bikes a decent amount of mileage. I got to ride the bikes here in Baldwin Park, California, and I also had the opportunity of riding the CVO Street Glide in the Black Hills of South Dakota when I went to Sturgis. So this review video takes place over multiple days and multiple test rides of these bikes. So we're going to start off with a walk around on this bike. I'm going to be going over all the details with you guys and talking to you about all the changes that have been made to this thing. These CVO motorcycles represent the biggest collection of changes ever applied to the Turing chassis platform in one single model year. Really the significance of this bike can't be overstated. We are in a new generation of Harley-Davidson touring bikes now. Harley threw a lot of things at this bike. We have a new fairing, new lighting, new bags. 
pretty much all the body work on the entire bike is brand new. I think with the exception of the rear fender. This is a major milestone for Harley Davidson and their touring family as a whole. 2023 model year CVOs are a bike that we'll probably talk about for the rest of Harley Davidson history. Now I have a whole new animal to dissect, analyze, review, ride, and really get my thoughts on. But I'm gonna be riding the bike right now for my very first time and given my initial thoughts, I don't think this review video is gonna be 100% comprehensive as I don't think most of the review videos on this bike are very comprehensive right, th right now just because there's just so much to unpackage in this bike. So we're gonna jump on this, spin it around. This is just kind of my first take on the new CVOs. And obviously I'm gonna be releasing a lot of additional future content on this new turning platform. All right, guys, let me take you through this bike and let me tell you everything I have learned about the new CVOs thus far. So right away, you see the bike visually is completely changed. The only thing that remains the same body work wise is the rear fender. So let's talk about probably the most important body piece there is, and that is the two new fairings. This is super significant because if you go back in Harley Davidson's history, really this fairing hasn't changed that many times. In 1979, we saw the Tour Glide, which was the first time Harley Davidson and had their fixed fairing that ran from 79 to 96 and then in 1998 they had the first road glide come out and that was when we saw the first road glide fairing and that fairing ran until 2013 and then in 2014 that's when the project Rushmore came out which was a huge change in the Turing family but there was no road glide in the 2014 model year it wasn't until the 2015 model year when the new road glide fairing first came out and that's the fairing that really changed the game for the road glide the appeal went up the popularity of the road glide surpassed that of the street glide and that's really when the road glide made a huge splash in the motorcycle world and just catapulted into popularity let's look at the batwing fairing real quick so in 1969 that's when harley davidson first introduced their initial version of the batwing fairing on a motorcycle which has been probably the most replicated shape in the motorcycling industry and that fairing was modified slightly over the years just to accommodate things like CD players and different technology that came about. And then in the 2014 model year, Project Rushmore, like I mentioned, that's when you had the new slipstream fairing on there when they went to the touchscreen navigation and all that good stuff. And now in the 2023 model year, we're seeing the brand new Batwing fairing. So the new fairings are definitely visually striking. There's no question when you're rolling down the road that you have one of the brand new Harley Davidsons with the new fairing. I think that's one of the objectives of the designers. They wanted to make something that was very different visually and style wise, but more importantly, they wanted to make it functional and they wanted to make it perform at a higher level than the previous generation. The fuel tank, still a six gallon fuel tank. They did reshape it. They gave it more like a flat bottom that followed the lines of the bike. The gas cap is similar to what we saw in the Pan America where there's just a single latch. You no longer have to press that janky little button to open up a cap and then unscrew a plastic cap inside. So the cap is just opened up with one step now, a little bit quicker and easier. The saddlebags are redesigned. I really like the inward cut on the back tail of the saddlebags. I feel like that's a line and a shape that a lot of the custom guys in the aftermarket world have been using, mostly in the aggressive like performance and stunt world. I really like that Harley Davidson took note of that and shaped their new saddlebags with that line in there. There is more space in the saddlebags now, just slightly, not a huge difference there. The sides of the bags do like bulge out a little bit. They're not completely flat on the side. And that brings me to my first personal gripe about the bike. I do not like how the saddlebags bulge on the side, but that's just one of a few small nitpicks I have about the new design. Overall, I think the looks of this bike are stunning and Harley Davidson's designers did a fantastic job. They maintained the heritage and the classic line lines of the bikes but really modernize them in a very tasteful way. On the rear fascia there, you have the lighting that is similar to CVO lighting in the past, where you have the lighting housing situated between the rear fender and the saddlebags. That's all a new design where you have running lights and then you have a, a separate turn signal in there as well and brake lights. Speaking of lighting, let's talk about the lighting in the front. So the Rogue Glide has a big light bar on it. The bodywork on the front has a little bit of a W shape to try to separate the light bar a little bit to give it that distinct Rogue Glide look of a dual headlamp look. Personally, 
personally, I think it's a little bit too subtle. I would have liked to have seen more of a dual headlamp look on the Road Glide just to keep the front style and appearance more in line with what's traditionally been a dual light Road Glide look. But overall, this thing looks awesome. It looks different. It looks very modern. The slipstream vents on either side of the headlight are very well incorporated into the fairing where you can barely even notice them unless you look close. So it doesn't take away or break up the lines of the design of the fairing. Two other gripes that I have about the design of the bodywork on the CVO is I wish they would have color matched the cowl around the radiator on these bikes. You've got this fang spoiler type bodywork extending down off the bottom of the fairing and then it's immediately broken up by a black shroud around the radiator. I would have liked to have seen that color matched. I'm not sure why Harley didn't do that. Speaking of bodywork that should have been color matched, there's a couple black body pieces that are right below the two side covers on either side. Again, it would have been nice to have seen these color matched, especially on a CVO. It just breaks up the flow of the paint a little bit, and I'm not sure why Harley Davidson didn't color match paint those two pieces. I do love the details in the lighting. You have like Harley Davidson inscripted in a bar running across the main headlamp, and then you've also got the turn signals integrated into the fairing now, so you no longer have to worry about those separate little bullet turn signals that we've seen on the bikes for years. The front fender is smaller and lighter. It doesn't drop down as far along the back top higher as it used to in the previous models. You've got more of a low profile engine guard on these bikes as well. Kind of similar to the low profile engine guard that we've been seeing on the Road Glide and Street Glide specials in the last couple years. Harley Davidson has used their adversary collection for all the foot and hand controls. Super high premium stuff. Really nice contrast cut machined aluminum on here. And then you've got textured rubber inserts. So that's going to be your floorboards, your shift peg, your brake pedal, your grips, your mirrors. It's a collection that's been out now for about a year and they've applied that to the CVO models. Once you jump into the cockpit of the bike and look at the inner fairing, you'll notice right away that things look completely different. There are no longer any analog gauges. Everything is all digital. It's all incorporated into the new Skyline OS infotainment system that I'll get into a little bit more in just a minute. But the inner fairing also has redesigned cubbies for small items on the road glass you've got similar to what you've seen in the old road glide fairings however they are a little bit bigger they open up a little bit differently on the right hand side you still got the usb cord for you to plug in your phone for charging and to use things like apple carplay you do not have android auto for apple carplay you do need an active headset hooked up per apple's requirement to use apple carplay something that is very nice about the new street glide is you've got this nice drawer right underneath the infotainment system you press a button the drawer comes out the drawer is very large. It was pretty sad when the Rushmore project came out. You had this little boombox container to the right of the infotainment system that was supposed to house your phone. However, phones almost immediately outgrew that little box and nobody used it. I have never stored my phone in the little boombox area on the previous generation Batwing fairing models. And this time Harley Davidson made it really big for you to fit any smartphone in this drawer on the Street Glide fairing. The Road Glide glove box is really big as well well and you'll be able to fit any phone in there as well. Both models come in two different paint options. You've got the dark platinum which is like a dark gray color, a little bit more of a simplistic color. And then if you want to drop an extra $6,000, you can upgrade the paint to the Whiskey Neat with Raven Metallic. This is a super nice paint, by the way. The price is $6,000 extra above MSRP, which seems a little steep, but it is hand applied by Gunslinger. MSRP on this bike, by the way, is $42,999. There is a freight and surcharge as well. Surcharge on the CVOs is $1,200. Freight is $850. And some of the details on the bike like the lower rocker box covers and the adversary collection is going to change based on which color you went with. The exhaust system on the dark platinum has like this scorched chrome look to it. This really cool finish that is somewhere between black and chrome. So let's jump into what's arguably the most important part about the motorcycle and that is the engine. So you've still got a Milwaukee 8 so it shares the Milwaukee 8 basic engine architecture. However there are some significant changes about the engine that make it more powerful and 
and more efficient. First off, you've got a considerable bump in displacement. The old CVOs were 117 cubic inches. You've now got 121 cubic inches. We're now kind of bordering that two liter displacement mark, which is a big engine. Harley Davidson did a few things to make this a more powerful and more efficient engine. So they did increase the compression ratio. You are now at an 11.4 to one compression ratio up from a 10.2 to one compression ratio on the 117 Milwaukee 8. The new cylinder heads also have a combustion chamber reshaped with oval intake ports and low profile intake valve seats, which basically combine to increase the intake air velocity. You've got a 58 millimeter throttle body. It used to be a 55 millimeter and the throttle body is in a better position now closer to the center of the cylinder spacing, which increases airflow. But to accommodate these changes like the increased compression ratio, the bigger displacement, Harley Davidson had to incorporate a new cooling system into the bike. So most of the Milwaukee eights this year and in prior years have been just oil cooled. The limiteds with the lower leg fairings have all been twin cooled with coolant in there. They did change the passages around the exhaust ports on both of the heads and also the manner in which that coolant is transported around the heads to increase the cooling capabilities of this engine. So this new variable valve timing 121 version of the M8 circulates coolant around the heads. The rear cylinder first where it's hotter and then the coolant travels to the front cylinder. Then it circulates down into a large radiator near the front bottom portion of the down tubes right behind the front wheel of the bike. The other big improvement that I honestly never thought I would ever see implemented on the Milwaukee 8 is Harley Davidson has a variable valve timing system on this bike now which is all housed in the cam chest area. For those of you who aren't familiar with variable valve timing to put things simplistically the variable valve timing optimizes the engine output and efficiency throughout the rpm range so you're producing better power throughout the rev range and you're also getting better fuel economy throughout the rev range harley estimates a three to five percent more efficient fuel economy on this bike and with all these changes that i just mentioned harley davidson's claiming this 121 variable valve timing milwaukee 8 puts out a whopping 139 foot pounds of torque and 115 horsepower that's about eight percent more torque and about nine and a half percent more horsepower and sometimes i ask myself where is the ceiling on these engines because 121 cubic inches is just an absolute beast where i think most people are going to see the biggest improvement is from 65 miles an hour to 100 plus this thing is just going to continue to pull at high speeds out on the open highway so for that reason i feel like this engine is most applicable and optimized for getting out on the open road and doing touring style riding after just getting back from sturgis and i'm still on my 107 cubic inch milwaukee 8 getting on this thing and getting it on the highway was definitely a breath of fresh air my 107 going up large grades especially packed down with all my luggage and everything i would have to spin the throttle and wait to get from 65 five to 90 miles an hour up a grade this 121 you're going to spin the throttle and you'll get there in a couple seconds speaking of power delivery there are three different ride modes on this bike you've got road you've got rain and you've got sport mode and you've also got a couple different programmable modes where you can tweak the different parameters things like throttle response engine braking the level of sensitivity in which your rider aids intervene in the event of like your brakes locking up or slick services the bike is equipped with an an IMU inertial measurement unit, which is the hardware that's required to communicate lean angle to enhance things like your drag torque slip control, your traction control, and your ABS. The electronic aids that we've seen for a few years now, which Harley Davidson calls their RDRS, the Reflex Defensive Rider System. So those electronic rider aids are present in these new CVOs as to be expected. Along with this bigger motor, you've also got an improved shift drum. One of the big complaints that I've always heard when people buy new bikes, especially people that are new to the Harley world is people say I can't find neutral it's hard to find neutral this new shift drum makes it a lot easier to find neutral the shifting is going to be smoother on these as well I definitely noticed that right away when I started riding these new CVOs you've got a better charging system on here as well it's increased by 20 percent to 58 peak amps up from 48 peak amps on the 117 Milwaukee 8. That's important because these things just suck a lot of juice. You've got the alarms, you've got the big speaker system, which I'll jump 
happen to in a minute. You've got the infotainment system. These batteries do get drained quickly and having that extra 20% of charging capability is going to be really nice and just keeping your battery topped off. In the racing bike world, in the sport bike world, weight is always kind of a big thing. The lighter your bike is, the faster it goes. Harley Davidson has been criticized over the years for just building continually heavier and heavier bikes. This year on these generation of Road Glide and Street Glide, Harley Davidson has actually cut 35 pounds off the Road Glide and about 31 pounds off the Street Glide. The Triple Trees, they cut like seven pounds off there. They cut weight in the fuel tank. Every little area was reconsidered to see where they could save weight on these new baggers. When I first heard these numbers, I was like, okay, wow, 35 pounds, whatever. That's not really a big deal when you're talking about an 800 plus pound bagger. What I personally experienced though, and maybe this is also in part to the wheels and the geometry, the front end and the inverted front end, this bike did actually feel lighter off the kickstand and the handling at slow speeds felt lighter and more agile. My muscle memory on these bikes is extremely sensitive. These CVOs are definitely lighter on their feet than the other current Turing models. Speaking of feet on the Street Glide and the Road Glide, you've got these two piece cast aluminum spoke wheels in the front and rear. You've got a 19 inch in the front and 18 inch in the rear. These are very similar to what we've seen on the CVOs in recent past years. However, the big difference is on the past CVO models, they've had the big 21 inch wheel in the front. Now you've got the 19. I personally feel like that decision was influenced by performance. Those big 21 inch wheels where they do look really good, they do make the steering feel a little bit heavier in the front and you've got more rotating mass up front as well, which affects things like handling and braking and things like that. So these are the externally mounted spoke wheels. So they are tubeless. You've got tire pressure monitoring on this bike as well, of course, but these wheels do look good. Probably one of my top three favorite things about these new CVOs is the new suspension. For years, the Turing motorcycles in Harley Davidson's lineup have been criticized for their suspension. So Harley Davidson improved that in a big way. In fact, this is probably one of the biggest improvements that I've seen on this bike when compared to the current Turing models. So Harley Davidson slapped on a 47 millimeter Showa inverted front fork. The front suspension travel is 4.6 inches. With an inverted front fork, you're really increasing the rigidity of it, which can be felt when you're braking really hard or going through a turn really hard. And in the rear, you've got a Showa dual outboard emulsion technology shock that has a three inch travel, which is up from about two inches. So you've got 50% more travel in the rear shocks, which makes a big difference. The rear shock also has two preload adjustments. You can set a baseline preload adjustment by removing the right saddlebag and adjusting the threaded preload adjuster with a spanner tool. That sets like your baseline preload adjustment. And then something new, it's got a remote hydraulic preload adjuster knob located on the left hand side by the saddlebag. And that's more of like an on the fly adjustment where you can adjust for about 100 pounds of cargo loading or short term passenger adjustment beyond that primary suspension setting that you did on the actual shock. Overall, the suspension has been been improved in a very big way. My prediction is a lot more people will be very satisfied with the stock suspension on these CVOs than they were on like the Road Glide and the Street Glides of old. That was one of the things that people upgraded pretty frequently on those bikes. The performance has been increased on the exhaust system. The muffler diameter was increased from four and a half inches up from the four inch diameter. I believe the exhaust fitment is still the same on these bikes. That's a common question that I'm getting already. People want to know if the current mufflers in the marketplace that fit the M8 exhaust will still fit this new bike? I believe the answer to that question is a yes. However, with the new tuning and the variable valve timing and everything, my only word of caution would be is to be very careful when you're just slapping like a header pipe on this bike or something. The tuning and the cam and everything is different on this bike. And so exhaust systems built for like the 114 M8 and the 117 M8 might run differently. So I'd be really careful about that. This bike is still really new and we haven't really tested all that stuff yet. Braking is another one that I'm excited about. You've got Brembo brakes in the front and rear. Contrary to what some people believe, Harley-Davidson has been running Brembo brakes since about 2008. The difference now though is you've got a radial mount front brake, which for those that aren't familiar with what that is, it's just a more stable and rigid way of mounting the brakes. So under heavy braking conditions, you will still retain the right amount and the proper pad to rotor contact patch, mounting the brake calipers in the traditional way and in heavy load situations, left room for brakes to flex. The brake rotor diameter is also increased to 320 
120 millimeters up from 300 millimeters. All the calipers are four piston Brembo calipers, including the rear brake. So let's take a minute and talk about the electronics on this bike. So right away, visually, when you're looking at the inner fairing, you've got this massive 12.3 inch screen, this new infotainment system with the Skyline OS, brand new operating system. This replaces all of your analog gauges. So all your gauges, your speedometer, your tachometer, all that is replaced with this digital screen. The new operating system is completely different, so it might take a little getting used to, but it is pretty intuitive and easy to navigate around once you get a little practice under your belt. The switches are all brand new as well. They are all metal, so real nice premium touch and feel on the switch housings. They did move some things around like cruise control and navigating the menus and volume and everything, so you will have to relearn all the switches. The switches, in my opinion, are a little bit busy. I like a really simplistic look on my switch housings and on my bikes in general. Although the riding I've done on these bikes so far, I've got used to the switches pretty quickly and it was pretty easy to navigate it and do what I wanted to do on the infotainment system with the new switches location and setup. Something that I do think is pretty cool is you can toggle between three different screen display options. You've got cruise, sport, and tour, which changes like your main HUD or your home screen where your speedometer and your tachometer are. You can do sport, which gives you your two gauges, your main gauges right front and center. You can do cruising mode, which is a nice combination of your gauges and like maybe like your maps or your media in the center of the screen or you can do touring mode which only has your speedometer takes away the tachometer and gives you a nice big viewable area of like your maps for example in case you want to see like the biggest viewable area for like your navigation so it is really customizable there's a lot of different things you can do in the menu you do have heated grips on this bike as well it's a different way to use it than the previous generation heated grips there's a button on the side you just press the button and there's like three different heat intensity levels there's no longer that knob on the side that you spin your grips intensity level can also be adjusted through the infotainment system as well. The screen is nice and contrasty. You can see it even in direct sunlight. So far, I really like the new infotainment system. I think my only gripe about it so far is I wish it was a little bit snappier. As you're navigating through the menus, clicking buttons real quick and everything. For a brand new system, it feels like the processor is a little bit slow or maybe the software isn't completely optimized for the OS or something. It's not bad, but small little gripe. I wish the navigating the menus was a little bit snappier. Cruise control for me too. I have to get a little bit more used to it. It seems like I can use the cruise control on the current touring model setup a little bit easier and on the fly. The cruise control here is on the top of the left switch housing, so I'll have to get used to that a little bit. They still look good. They still look clean. It's not like you're driving like a Honda Goldwing where things just get like way out of control with buttons and switches. You do have AM, FM radio. The antenna is hidden internally in the fairing. Just like the other current infotainment systems like the Boom Audio GTS system, you can voice command things like the navigation the radio, your media player, your phone. Voice command activation works very similar on this bike. The CVO Road Glide and Street Glide are equipped with a pretty dang nice audio system. You've got a 500 watt RMS amplifier powering four Rockford Fosgate Stage 2 speakers. In the saddlebags, you've got a 5 by 7 inch saddlebag speakers, 150 watts RMS power per speaker. In the front fairing, you've got 6.5 inch fairing speakers. They do offer a parts and accessory upgrade out of the catalog. You can upgrade your 5 by 7 inch saddlebag speakers to a 6 by 9 inch saddlebag speaker if you want a little bit more power and sound out of your stereo system. The system's loud. I mean just straight up. It's just loud and it works well. Commenting on the seat, the seat is considerably more comfortable than some of the prior year CVO models. I feel like in the past CVOs have been all about the style, the detail on the seat, keeping it that sleek cool style which nothing wrong with that. The seat on this bike maintains that cool styling and look with the detail on the seat with the Alcantar paneling, which is like a suede material oftentimes used in the automotive industry. You've got this nice piping on there as well. Really nice high level of detail in the seat, but you've got, in my opinion, about 100% more cushioning on the seat as well. That's just kind of my anecdotal feel of the comfort on the seat. Still probably not the best long haul, 600 mile plus in a day type of seat, but it's a heck of a lot better than the CVO seats that I'm used to. To seeing on the road glide and the street glide. So let's talk about the bars here for a second because I think it's really important. A lot of people want to change the bars and customize their bikes and the ease of changing bars can be pretty huge for some people. I don't know what the stats are on these things. I'm just totally going off gut here, but I think it's either like an eight inch or a 10 inch rise on the bars stock. And you're probably got, I think it's like probably like a one and a quarter inch diameter on these bars as well. So it looks real meaty, real thick, like a substantial strength and proportions are real good for a big touring bike. But if you see here, the bar clamp is perched right on top there 
there where you don't have all the shrouding and the gauges that once covered it all up on the previous generation Rogue Glide. So it appears that the ease of customization is going to be a lot more accessible on this Rogue Glide CVO than it has been in the past. In the past, if you wanted to do anything other than like a bagger bar, you'd have to cut the shrouding and relocate the gauges and it just became messy and expensive. So bars you got the traditional clamp. It looks like it tapers up to maybe an inch and a quarter. Again, I'm just going off of gut here what it looks like. Street Glide, however, you still got the same restrictions with the Batwing fairing where you had to have a bar that's specifically designed for that Batwing fairing to fit it. Again, it looks like it's either like a one inch or one and a quarter inch bar on the Street Glide. So your ability to get creative and do something big and radical bars wise on the Street Glide is a little bit more inhibiting than like say like the Road Glide where changing bars should be pretty dang easy. And you've got some of the other electronic gizmos that you expect from a CVO motorcycle. Things like the remote locking on the key fob and the flip out barrel key that you get with the CVOs. You get the other goodies like bag liners and bike cover. This also comes with one of the headsets as well that you can pair immediately and start using the Apple CarPlay on here. But that about does it on all the stats and all the gizmos that come new on this bike. Sorry, that was kind of long winded, but there is a lot to take in on these new CVOs. Like I said, I'm going to be testing these more thoroughly and making additional videos as I get more mileage under my belt on these things to kind of give you guys the pros and cons of these bikes a little bit more. I've had a Road King, I've had Street Glides, Road Glides, out of the box, by far, this is the best bike that I've ever ridden. Nice. I'm, I'm stoked, I want one bad, yeah. I want to have one and make it my own. I just, a lot of the stuff that I love about it is the fact that to be in sixth gear going 100, twist the throttle and it goes. Through the Sorry. variable valve timing, yeah. Yeah, so that was my opinion. Great bike, I want one. We were with a guy that had a built bike, and we don't normally like race. Uh -huh. We always race. <laughs> but we we did the four three two one and four four three two one and five and four three two one and six and this bike is pulling the whole way. Really? The only thing that stopped it was the rev limiter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had the short shift and then it capped out at one twelve. Okay. Otherwise one, I'm gone. One twelve, huh? Yeah, okay. Okay. one thirteen. You ain't gone on me. Oh I capped you too. Nah, nothing so keeps up with me. <laughs> a little bit. Let me guess, Lance, your bike doesn't have a governor on it. No. <laughs> I was riding 120 quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. It's good to know that people are liking the new CVOs. And we still have uh, about 1,800, probably another 2,000 miles we're going to hit on it. So uh, we definitely thoroughly tested out the rain mode and traction control and none of us went down so that's a good thing, right? So yeah, the bikes are rad though. Uh, this is definitely my longest ride on the new CVO, the new touring platform. Yeah, great acceleration at 121, variable valve timing. I didn't even really put it through its max paces, but really good strong power uphill. You know, and it's so, it's managed very well with the different ride modes. I was riding a lot with rain mode and you know it's a lot like the bikes we've talked about in the past where the power and the, and the way that it, it comes on it's very gradual with rain mode sport mode it's a lot quicker the throttle's a lot snappier and then road mode is kind of somewhere in between and then typically on like bikes like my pan america i like the road mode it's just kind of an even middle of the road power delivery and braking and like abs intervention and everything i do like the the street glide fairing I feel like both of the fairings were really, really good in terms of deflecting wind. The uneven like fluttering and head buffeting was pretty much non-existent. But yeah, overall, great bikes, super impressed. Stereo's extremely good, lighting is phenomenal. 
uh, the brake brakes felt great. Yeah, the suspension, I think it's probably the, the, the shining thing about this bike when compared to the previous generation touring models is the suspension. For years and years and years, everybody has kind of complained about the fact that the suspension on Harley Davidson's touring street glides and road glides was a little bit subpar based on the class that it's in, and that is the touring class, which should be all about comfort. The suspension now on these CVOs is light years better. I feel like a lot of people will buy these bikes and won't even think about upgrading the suspension, which is a great thing, which is kind of what people expect from a $43,000 bike, right? Yeah, kudos to Harley Davidson. They really did develop an awesome bike with these CVOs. So that about sums it up guys. I know this video turned into a little bit more of a laundry list than a full review just because there is so much on this bike to cover and I know a lot of people want to know all the details that comes on the new CVOs. That's one of the big reasons why people watch my channel is they know they're going to get all those little details. But really everything measurable performance wise like braking, power, suspension, fairing, performance, electronics with the infotainment system, everything is improved and it didn't take me very long to figure that out. And a lot of of those areas it's significantly improved anybody that criticizes harley for old paint and bold new graphics every year take a look at this bike harley has spent a ton of money in r d on this bike completely revamped the touring platform with these new cvos one of the frequently asked questions i get is okay will these changes be applied to the non-cvo models at this point harley davidson isn't commenting on that just like every other company in the entire world that doesn't comment on future products of course we don't know what's coming out in the future but i think one thing is safe to say these new touring chassis changes aren't going to die with the 23 model year cvos i for one my next bike will be one of these bikes with the new touring changes on it i think the storm glide is about to get retired she's been great i've loved her she's still a great bike i had a great time on sturges it was the perfect way for me to sunset the storm glide but after riding these new cvos i just i gotta have one this is this is harley davidson's future and i'm going to be a part of harley davidson's future so i'm sure i'll be doing a lot more videos on bikes that have these new touring updates on them this is a huge huge moment for harley davidson i can't stress that enough you got their core motorcycle segment in the grand american touring line and we've just seen probably the most massive change to that segment in the history of the motor company the frame is still the same it's the frame that we saw changed in 2009 so this frame has been run for a long time you still got the basic bones of the milwaukee 8 but other than that guys pretty much every Everything has been changed. These bikes represent the future of Harley Davidson, and I'm excited to be along for the ride. Thanks a lot, guys. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below. If you're looking for a new or used Harley Davidson in Southern California, come check out Laidlaw's Harley Davidson, family owned and operated for over 65 years. Never any added dealer markup, transparent sales process. Come see me or my team at Laidlaw's HD. See you on the next one, guys. Thanks a lot. Later.